So everybody's a donor. You bring stuff, you bring money, or you bring time. On the show today, we are joined by Chris Anderson, the construction manager for Habitat for Humanity in Snohomish County, Washington. Prior to Habitat for Humanity, Chris owned and operated a home inspection business after retiring from a 22-year career as a senior business and project manager in the high-tech industry. Today, Chris talks about the incredible work that goes into a Habitat for Humanity build and how, through his work, he's been able to identify a unique leadership philosophy that can bridge across both nonprofit and for-profit organizations. This is The Career Cue, the podcast focused on helping you navigate the signals in your career to keep you growing and moving forward in business and in life. Here's today's host, Stacey Harris. So, Chris, it's great to have you here today. Thanks so much for joining us. Of course. I'm going to be talking about Habitat for Humanity and the work that's being done and how you're involved with the organization. But we're actually also going to be talking about a leadership philosophy that we love to hear that you've shared with us that we think is super important to actually share with a bigger audience. And therefore, that's why we're having that conversation today. But let's actually go back to your professional story. How is it that you got to where you are today? Well, uh, of course, there's a variety of answers, but really probably the best place to start is uh, January of 2011. I had been working at Microsoft for a number of years, coming up on 20 years, and I began to recognize that it wasn't going to go on forever for a variety of reasons, uh, some good, some bad. (laughs) And in January, I was working with a consultant that I admired and was pitching some kind of idea that was really around how I thought about planning and doing stuff. And he asked me a question, uh, did I have any personal examples? And the sort of shocking, as I, I didn't have anything, I sort of stumbled and said, no, I don't. And that, uh, that question, as, uh, as simple as it was, sort of triggered a whole examination of what's coming next. And I knew fairly quickly, uh, within a couple of months, whatever came after Microsoft needed to be at the intersection of people coming together to do some kind of good work and uh, also a fairly complex sort of project management because those are the things that I enjoyed enjoyed doing. So now carry forward, we're now six years later or so, and I've uh, located and I'm working in that intersection. Mm, mm. <laughs> so uh, it was really th- through sort of an understanding that I needed to uh, get out and contribute in a, in a way that was – you know, you've you've heard of the term making rich people richer, mm-hmm. uh, and that's sort of that. That's the big bucket uh, that I put my efforts in uh, back at the time. And uh, so, getting out and uh, getting first uh, out of the sort of the machine, and getting back into the real world, I first started doing home inspections, uh, which uh, here in the state of Washington, you have to be licensed, uh, extensive training to go through and do that. But it was a lot of fun and very interesting. And as I was building my business, I began also to volunteer at Habitat. A a friend of mine, another Microsoft colleague from way back, uh, had been volunteering there. And I started there and uh, probably maybe contributed 40 or 40 to 50 hours or so over the course of several months, helping them build uh, the interior of uh, a new store, of a, of a Habitat store that they're opening in Lin- Linwood. And uh, that was a lot of fun, very good people, uh, and they needed a construction manager. And uh, so that uh, was, the more we talked about it, the more it seemed like just the right thing. And so I took the job on uh, November 1st of 16, and I've been doing it, uh, I guess, 15 now. So I've been doing it 14 months. Wow. So, wow. So anyway, that's yeah. a that's a sort of a quick uh, history of how I went from A to B. Yeah. <laughs> well, and and you know, we heard in your bio you actually started out your early early career kind of already in construction. Well, right? yes, I I did that as a I, I think of uh, the world is sort of working for a company or you're freelance. Mm-hmm. And those are the sort of the two big buckets. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and prior to working at Microsoft, I'd never worked in any kind of corporate job. And really, when I started looking for a job with benefits, that was my primary mm-hmm. goal back in 1990. It was the late fall of 1991 when I started looking for a job that ultimately landed me at Microsoft. All of the prior years had been doing freelance stuff, freelance graphic arts, uh, freelance carpentry, if you will, uh, doing uh, just jobs that I could uh, pick up in the neighborhoods where I was living. 
things like that. So I did have a lot of carpentry experience that uh, helped me sort of get going. Mm. Um, and e- even some family history. My father was an engineer, and mm. so I grew up learning how to build things, take things apart, put them back together, mm-hmm. and uh, that kind of thing. So now helping build affordable housing is just right in the mm. right is right in the sweet spot of yeah. what I what I needed to be doing. Well, and it's great that you identified. It sounds like it was an unintended result of those conversations that you were having with that consultant that perhaps four to six years ago, it, that, that really wasn't the vision that you had. Yeah, fairly quickly, I came to the conclusion that I needed to actually be building stuff to actually uh, have stuff at the end of the day mm. because uh, so much of uh, working in a large uh, tech company is theoretical. I would work on you know, what's the best process for talking to a customer uh, about this problem? Okay, so we would figure that out. Uh, and then you deploy whatever the answer is. And what? What do you write your own in the next thing? You right. never you never see it. Right. Uh, no one ever calls back, hey, that was a great procedure, Chris. <laughs> wow, that worked perfectly. Right? No, uh, but uh, now we just finished a house uh, in uh, in Everett uh, to see the family and their three kids playing in the yard or sitting around the Christmas tree. Mm. Right? That's uh, that's real stuff. I did it. I helped. Real, real impact, <laughs> like you're right. changing Right, and uh, lives. and I drive by there if I'm within mm. a within a few blocks. Yeah. Right, I cruise by. Just, mm. uh, so that's cool, and that's. Uh, a, I'm one of the few paid staff, the only paid staff for the construction effort. Everything else is done by volunteers. Mm. So uh, it would be more accurate to say they built the house and I was there sort of standing around to help them make sure they (laughs) have the right stuff. Well, Uh, but you're serving in a leadership capacity, right? Because you can't have a whole bunch of volunteers turn up and say, No, it it is. No. uh, Years ago, I had this sort of vision. I like riding bicycles. And bicycle to me is a beautiful, a beautiful system. Very, very simple. And I started uh, sort of imagining the world where you had these uh, two functions. One is steering if you're on a bike, and you can move the handle back and forth as much as you want. If you're not pedaling, it doesn't matter where you steer, (laughs) right? (laughs) But then the pedaling is a separate and distinct function, right? And you can pedal all you want. And it's those two things together, right? The steering is the planning, and the pedaling is the doing. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to our our volunteer builders, uh, they're really helping do the majority of the pedaling. Mm -hmm. And they also do most of the planning as well. So they steer the project along. My role is sort of the framework, right? Being able to organize that energy to be able to interpret the steering signals in a way Mm -hmm. to make sure we're in the right gear, right? right? So when they pedal, we actually go in the direction that that we want to go. The intended direction. So that's sort of... You know how I how mm. I think about the pieces fitting together. So I want to come back to that, but before we go on, I actually want to talk. Habitat for Humanity is is a globally recognized brand, and and you and I have actually had that discussion offline mm-hmm. that it's really it's a well known one. Sure, yeah. yeah, very yeah, very positive feelings about yeah. Habitat for Humanities yeah. around the world. Yeah, for the folks that perhaps not they've heard of Habitat, but they're not quite sure. What sure. are some of the challenges that the organization is focusing on trying to solve? If you look at it in a sort of a real world uh, functional way, what do these people do? Uh, we're home builders, mm. and we're home builders with a, a focus on building affordable homes that would house uh, families who would otherwise not be able to uh, pull it off to buy a home. Mm. And we make the homes affordable by primarily getting people to build it for us for nothing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Volunteers. <laughs> Volunteers. Yes. And there are also some other functions. Uh, our affiliate has, uh, and it's common across most of the Habitat affiliates, uh, a store. Uh, so people will be able to uh, donate their gently used uh, building materials, kitchen cabinets, uh, old appliances, things like that, which then we'll refurbish a little bit and then resell. Mm. Uh, that money then comes back into our building fund. Oh, okay. uh, so we're trying to have an impact on uh, reducing the uh, materials that go into landfill uh, through reuse and recycle uh, and also at the same time generating money to build more affordable homes. Mm-hmm. So. That's sort of the mechanics of it. Yeah. Now, here in our particular area, it's important to recognize that uh, in in the Seattle metro area, we're under enormous pressure for housing. The uh, read recently in the Seattle Times that there are, I think, ten thousand 
apartment units on the books to be constructed in this year, 2017. 10,000, right? And they're expecting that to reduce the pressure somewhat on housing and housing costs in the area. But uh, all of those 10,000, I promise you, are all high-end apartments mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and will have uh, very little affordable housing. So the emphasis on what we're doing is really uh, it becomes more important Mm. uh, to provide a a way for people to uh, live within the metro area in in an affordable way, close to jobs and transportation. So that's really the the impact that we're Mm. trying to have. Mm. I love that because, you know, there's a lot of conversation about how well the real estate market is doing and especially certain pockets like Seattle. Oh, But unless you're in it and you have the funds to be able to continue to invest in it, the basic need of shelter becomes a significant challenge. And then you couple that with the fact of accessibility to public transportation and and, if you're commuting two hours each way and catching three buses, like what's the reality of that? Yeah. Yeah. No, very difficult. I just in the last year moved about an hour north. Uh, I was living in in the northern northern suburbs, moved an hour north. It cost me $1,000 less a month to live, right? So definite financial impact Mm. uh, there. But uh, everybody faces that. Right. uh, So. But the the fact that Habitat is is, um, in the communities that are – they're trying to make sure that it's it's not excluding folks that aren't able to keep up with the real estate sure, market. Yeah, sure. absolutely. So let's talk about your primary responsibilities throughout the year because you have your build time. Mm-hmm. But as with building any house, there is significant planning that goes into that. Sure. But it's not just about the house. It's, it is about the volunteers. So as you look at breaking ground, the timeline may shift, but – what does that look like before you actually meet your first volunteer and you get the sure. first shovel out? What, is that, sure. what does that look like? Well, so I've broken down building a house into, into five steps uh, because it helps make the story easy to tell. And the first step is all about the plans and the permits. And it's a step that's largely done by sort of uh, specifically trained uh, folks, architects, engineers, the permit specialists at uh, the city, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, So there's not a lot of general uh, activities that are good for just, uh, just the volunteer builders. But starting with step two, sites and foundations, then we are now uh, making a difference in the earth. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> a- yes. And that requires, uh, that requires our builders to help us out. So uh, just to use our current project as sort of a framework, we're building uh, – the plan is to build a four-unit a uh, fourplex, uh, so four homes uh, together in a single building. Um, I want to start construction on 7-1, uh, 17 of this year. Uh, so step two, sites and foundations, will start on that day. And uh, the planning and permits has been sort of in uh, in production now. That's uh, my sort of current activity. So for the next five months, I'll be working on getting the permits to build a house uh, and trying to prepare as much as possible sort of the logistical challenges of getting all that material into one place and getting all the people into that one place. That's how how I sort of think about my job as a uh, Concert master, ring <laughs> ring master, <laughs> maybe. Uh, but it's uh, having materials and people arrive at a at a particular location, uh, and then uh, having people standing around that know what to do with it. Right. So well, and you had mentioned in a previous conversation that we had, you're looking at budget management, you're looking at people management, but the the sheer number of hours and the algorithm that you use to determine how many volunteers you will need for any given project. That's something that's a behind-the-scenes kind of coordination and calculation that people aren't seeing once the once the build starts, right? Sure. But for in order for that build to be successful, you're in an Excel spreadsheet trying to figure oh, out, right? Because it, sure. it's math. Um, it's yeah, if it, we have X amount of volunteers, they'll be able to meet this many hours. Yeah. Uh, again, the, uh, one of the nice things about building a house is you can actually go out and see it. It, it is so concrete. You can go out and touch it and, you know, the two by fours and right. all, all the rest. So that makes it easy to at least conceptualize to the end. And I think it makes it easier to uh, tell the story, uh, right, to get people involved in doing this because you can, right, you can go out and uh, touch it and see it. 
So, but you're right. For me, that uh, that's a level of, of detail. Uh, again, when I started thinking about what am I going to do next back in 2011, it did need to have that kind of uh, complexity involved in it because that was part of uh, the work I did at Microsoft that was very exciting and fun. And yeah. it was that discovery. It was a, it's a matter of sort of understanding uh, something and looking so closely that you begin to understand how it operates. Mm -hmm. And so the house we just finished, we did a, me in particular, but then the other people who led the construction did a good job of sort of tracking how things went, uh, when we spent money, uh, what phase we worked on, at what date, and so on. And uh, we'll try to extrapolate from that experience uh, building this next thing and ideally uh, be able to forecast as much as possible sort of uh, when the big money is due because somebody needs to go out and raise it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And uh, if someone needs to go out and get commitments uh, from well over a thousand volunteers to mm. come out and help me build this house. Wow. So the planning and sort of the numbers uh, is uh, not exciting. And I don't tell people uh, about that part of the story because their eyes glaze over. <laughs> no, we need to keep focused on the four families that mm. we're going to uh, mm. write, create a place for them to grow their family mm. for, for literally generations. Mm. And so that's the compelling part. Mm. <laughs> and uh, that it takes 16,400 hours to build this fourplex, mm. nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> I need to know because yeah. I need to know how many people I need to round up to yeah. go get this done. Yeah. Uh, well, but beyond that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I would imagine, though, that every after every project, there is an opportunity to be able to identify increased efficiencies. Oh, sure. Right? Absolutely. Um, no. To apply that for next time to either Absolutely. decrease ta- cost and or time. Sure. Um, well, uh, and that and that is relevant, right? Mm. Uh, we're our sort of construction mantra is a simple, decent home. Mm. Everyone should have a simple, yeah. decent home. Yeah, right. I love that. Uh, who can argue with? Right, that? you can't. So, yeah. uh, uh, so the simple, decent is sort of our quality guideline, and within that, uh, you know, our typical material cost for building a three-bedroom home is around seventy-five thousand dollars, which is yeah, which is dirt cheap. Yeah, it's unheard <laughs> of, right? Like, there's no way. That so, you can and that. Uh, yeah. and uh, ultimately, the families are responsible for a mortgage that replaces our direct cost. Mm-hmm. So, the cost of of building. And uh, the land cost. Mm. Uh, so we shoot for around one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars, and so that becomes the sort of the, the primary mortgage for the owner, mm. uh, compared to a home that might the home we just finished uh, appraised for two hundred and fifty seven thousand. Mm. So their mortgage is somewhere in the one hundred and fifty. So r- right away they've uh, they've landed some equity uh, in the home. That's and, the affordability. Yeah, oh. and that's uh, that's the affordability. Mm. So. Okay, so. Sites and foundations. Yes. What comes after that? So after you've pre- sort of prepared the ground and the foundation is the big concrete sort of structure that holds the house up, the next thing is the structure and uh, and the uh, doors, windows, siding, roof. Uh, so you have a, a secure, weather-tight structure. Mm. So structure and dry-in is number three. Uh, as soon as that's finished and the site is uh, the interior is secure, you can begin installing the systems, electrical, plumbing. Hmm. Uh, heating and cooling, and then the fourth system is insulation. And then step five is closing it all up. Uh, uh, step five starts with the installation of drywall, and it ends uh, as you final do the final cleanup and dusting and uh, hand the keys over. Huh. So. Yeah, when you put it like that, it seems very systematic. S- simple. Yeah, yeah. I explained to builders coming on the site, this is a, a very frequent question. I've never done this before. Right. And uh, it's just like Ikea. You've done Ikea, haven't you? <laughs> right. And, yeah. and most people say, yeah, 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 except, okay, so we need to find our own pieces and cut them to the right size. And we need to know where the fasteners go. But other than that, it's just Ikea, yeah. just over and over and over yeah. again. Just on a large scale. Yeah. <laughs> just, uh, just, on, just more zeros. Well, and as I write this down, and I know that our listeners can't see me doing this, but as I write this down, I realize that there might be an even opportunity for you to be able to apply your own professional development to these five steps, right? To look at your plans, sure, right? Sure. To look at the sites and foundation and to be able to yeah. like just start and dig that first piece out. Yeah. And then you got to develop the structure and put all the walls up and the roof on. And yeah. Uh, no, so you could, it, yeah. You can apply, apply these steps to Thanksgiving dinner. 
<laughs> right? Or to whatever, uh, right? Uh, but it's it's the yeah. same thing. What's, yeah. the, what's the plan? Do you have everything you need to yeah. launch off? And then just go start. Just and, go do it. Yeah. And it goes back to that reuse, recycle, right? Like as you said, it can be applied to anything that, that's going on in life. We need to take a quick break, but when we come back, I actually want to, I'd love to dig more into the volunteer piece, both for the work that's being done through the incredible volunteer program at Habitat for Humanity, but also let's talk about your leadership philosophy. I'm not going to give it away just now because uh, it's yours and I love it. You want to tease it before the break? (laughs) (laughs) I want to make sure that uh, you're the one that actually talks about that. So stay with us. We'll be back in a minute. Thanks for listening. Be sure to check out the show notes at thecareerq.com where you can also subscribe to the podcast and sign up for our newsletter. So today we're here with uh, Chris Anderson, and Chris is the construction manager for the Snohomish County affiliate of Habitat for Humanity. And before the break, we talked to Chris about his professional journey and the work that's being done at Habitat for Humanity. Uh, You touched on the volunteer piece and how integral that uh, every volunteer it's is. It's the magic yeah, yeah. <laughs> behind Habitat. Yeah. So let's actually dig a little bit deeper into that. Being a volunteer for Habitat for Humanity, what are some of the options and how can people kind of look into it further to be able to identify some opportunities for them or how they can actually help their local community? Well, it's uh, we have essentially two basic activities that we organize uh, in order to uh, create more affordable housing in the county. And the first is uh, that activity directly, so you can volunteer as a builder. And then the second activity, uh, we mentioned also the stores. So you Mm. can, uh, the stores are uh, largely volunteer uh, run. Uh, We probably have any particular day uh, when we have an active construction site going on, we might have 50 or 60 volunteers uh, in total uh, across the store Mm. and construction. But the affiliate itself only has 12 staff. So in the same way that the houses are built by essentially people donating their time, Mm. the stores are operated in the same way. They rely 100% on people donating their time to Mm. come and help us uh, organize, sort through the stuff, clean, fix, blah, blah, blah. And that's maybe true for all volunteer organizations that that's the core core purpose. Mm. So how to get involved really can be as simple as just logging on to our website, and we have a path to sort of sign up for volunteering there. And uh, it goes through. You can, uh, after a few clicks and steps here and there, you can begin uh, getting uh, the calendar that shows you the opportunities uh, that we have open. Again, we won't have any kind of regular construction activities until we start our build in July. But as far as people sort of giving now, uh, that's very easy to do if you hit the hit the website. And yeah. In. Yeah. Well, and so speaking of giving, it could be, do you have, are you renovating your kitchen? Do you have materials that you can donate or supporting that, through the store to actually go to purchase? That's yeah. a very, no, that's an excellent point, which I need to add to my list of how to how to donate is bring your gently mm. used building materials mm. by, and we can, uh, we certainly uh, value that. I love so, shopping at Habitat for Humanity. I find some of the most amazing yeah. finds in there. It's incredible what yeah. you can find. Because a lot of people maybe... Like, I don't have the money to be able to contribute or donate to an organization like Habitat. But it really comes down to is if you have time, that's as equally effective as it is. So yeah. so everybody's a donor. Uh, you, you bring stuff, you bring money, or you bring time. Mm. And it's the time that I would say is the hardest to sort of uh, <laughs> get people to give. Yeah. So from my perspective, the most valuable. And so. so as far as the build is concerned, I mean, it could be something that you sign up as an individual mm-hmm. or a small team of people, whether sure. it be family or coworkers. If you have an organization out there that's looking for an opportunity for team building because you're giving back to a community, but you're also you're working within a community. It's a core yeah. part of our strategy to get the next house built is – uh, doing really good at these group uh, mm. uh, group bills. Okay. Um, and uh, it's not a new thing for us. We have, uh, throughout our project that we just completed, we had strong support from Boeing. Mm. They had a group of builders, 15 or 20 mm. Boeing engineer builders out every month, and we made enormous amount of progress. So... Uh, and there's lots of uh, lots of different smaller groups that uh, we have uh, for that. Our sort of uh, builder strategy is to get good at getting group commitments and having group build days for a day of caring. And there's mm. all different kinds of mechanisms uh, within larger corporations to support this kind of mm. thing. 
And then we're also, if you look back at the information and uh, who built the last project, you'll find that there was a lot of people who came once or twice. Mm. And then there's a small group of people who came 20 and 30 mm. times. And so uh, we want to do really good at uh, getting group commitments. Uh, I have 205 build days that I need to fill. Uh, so groups will supply a lot of that, but I'm also looking for uh, sort of a, a group of uh, retirees that can join us during the week on mm. Tuesdays or Thursdays. Mm-hmm. Those are our build days mm-hmm. there that can form the second uh, group of uh, people who come frequently. That's so, great. Yeah. Well, so we'll have links to uh, the website and ways to contact your team in the show notes if you have some time. You don't, it's not even about just swinging the hammer or, you know, building the frame, right? We're talking about painting. Yeah. You're talking about the interior uh, finishes as well. So um, what, Whatever we have going that yeah. day, it's yeah. uh, often people are interested, you know, I want to I want to redo the drywall in my home. So can I come when we're doing drywall? Mm. So, well, no. <laughs> 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 no, I want you to come and, uh, right. you know, whatever's on the plan right. uh, is what we need to tackle. Right. Now, if it happens to be drywall, well, that's that's, that's a win. perfect. Yes. That's perfect. Yeah. That's a win. So. <laughs> well, so uh, before we uh, wrap up, and I, I love the work that you're doing, Chris, and, and the work that's being done at Habitat everywhere, and I'm a huge fan. I, I'd love to shop Thank there. Yeah. Uh, we'd love to be able to donate our time this year too, and we'll definitely be reaching out to your team for that. But let's talk about this leadership philosophy before we wrap up the core part of our conversation today. You've discussed the philosophy or you live the philosophy that everyone is a volunteer, and we're going to quote you on this one. (laughs) So I love this so much, and I'm not going to be able to do it justice, so I'm just going to hand it off to you to explain what that is. Well, it's... um Again, working within a large for-profit uh, business and doing that for many, many years, you sort of drink the Kool-Aid and you get the earnings report and the stock is up and costs are down and blah, blah, blah. In my role as a leader within that framework, there's always sort of this implication that I didn't sign the checks, but I did really. And so you should do right what I say, oh, uh, right? Yeah. Whatever's important to me becomes important to you. And I think that's uh, – it, it never really worked. Right. Uh, in, a, in a practical example, uh, in my uh, time leading others uh, within the for-profit enterprise, that uh, you couldn't do that. You had to respect and you had to engage and had to understand what's important to that individual to get them to move. And I realize now working within this volunteer organization that what I was really struggling with uh, in the for-profit enterprise is something that is now just out on the open, is that Everybody's a volunteer. Everybody makes a conscious choice to act and to do something that they enjoy. So here it's explicit and it's exposed and I have to deal with it. But the more I do that, the more I realize that I I should have taken that approach the entire time, Mm. right? That everybody's a volunteer. It doesn't matter if I'm paying you. And I know from my own personal experience, if I think about me personally, it doesn't matter that I was getting a check and uh, had more money than I knew what to do with it, right? You know, if it was a stupid idea. I still wasn't going to do it, <laughs> right? right. Uh, it didn't, uh, well, the money uh, right? It just wasn't. And maybe yeah. that's, uh, you know, maybe that's uh, just my own personal thing. Money has not been ever super important to me. It hasn't been the big driver. And so maybe this is more just uh, an observation that's relevant for me. But the more I, I think about it, approaching people as a volunteer, mm-hmm. uh, right, is the right way. Mm. Uh, because so, ultimately people are volunteering to do that. They, yeah, they are. Right. Yeah, they are. And if you can think about other things, but that just gets in the way. Yeah. Right. They're volunteers and they're there because they choose to be. Yeah. And uh, I love that. And that actually got me thinking, like, it made me realize too, like, yeah, people are turning up because they choose to. Like, they may feel like they have to have a job, but yeah. there are other jobs yeah. out there. Yeah. Right. And yeah. if you're going to be treated no. as do as I tell you because of what's yeah. important to me, that's that's short lived. And yeah. short-sighted. Yeah, you circumvent uh, the whole listening, mm. uh, you know, when you uh, get caught up in that. Mm-hmm. And it, uh, so uh, that's uh, sort of my discovery as I go forward, that uh, if you treat everyone as though they could just literally walk away in that moment, yep. then you have to sort of stand in there and listen, uh, pay attention to what they're doing, yep. and uh, make sure that they're into it, right? Yep. That there is something that you've discovered. Maybe you'll never know. But they start sort of knocking out the work. Mm-hmm. and then, Okay, must have made some kind of connection. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. That's 
That's awesome. I, and I would encourage all of our listeners to think about taking that perspective and seeing where they can apply it in their daily lives. This has been a great conversation and I'm looking forward to having you come back into the studio because there's uh, so much more that we (laughs) want to talk about. But before we go, I actually want to just chat about some of the kind of standard stuff that we talk, but it's so not standard, right? Because (laughs) there's never one uh, answer that's the same. What was your first job and what were the fundamentals that you learned that you still use today? So it's a little fuzzy. (laughs) <laughs> but the uh, but the job that really s- stuck with me as sort of a turning point and as a, a, a and I think gets to the intent of your question was uh, selling fire alarms door to door. Now that seems like sort of an odd job. Uh, this was in El Paso and it was in the nineteen seventy five seventy six, and the fire alarms that I'm are, are not the little miniature smoke right. detectors that we talk about today. Right. These were big. They were about uh, as big as maybe a record, uh, uh, a 12-inch vinyl LP uh, with a big metal bell. That was the big. uh, And then uh, inside, a spring mechanism, Mm -hmm. uh, and you wound it up, and there was a little tab on it. When the tab got hot, it popped off, and and it unwound and rang the bell Mm -hmm. very loud and woke the people up, and they escaped their house. So these were the devices that I was selling door to door. Now we were selling in neighborhoods that were very uh, sort of low economic, and uh, the things were expensive. They would sell on time, and it was a really very hard sell kind of thing. And I could do it, you know. And I sold enough alarms to sort of uh, keep going, but it was uh, high pressure sales was too much. Mm. Uh, that felt uncomfortable to me. So what's the big learning? Well, the big learning is that there were people that could sell those fire alarms, and they absolutely loved it. And I always came away from that experience with, you need to love what you're doing in order to do it well, right? So that was a good uh, a good learning. Now, have I been consistent throughout? Mm, maybe not. I violated that plenty of times <laughs> along the way, right? Because you have your economic self-interest mm-hmm. uh, in, involved. But to me, it was that the initial thing of uh, of understanding how to pitch something of how to talk about something and, and make the offer and really uh, being successful when you uh, 100% believe it, mm. right? Uh, and that's what <laughs> – <That's laughs> so that was, sort of the, wow. uh, that was uh, sort of the first uh, first lesson in trying mm. to make a living. <laughs> I love that. And even if it's not something that you've consistently practiced, it's something that you go back to. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah it was a very interesting sort of formative moment about, yeah. uh, about selling stuff because mm. I don't think of myself as a salesman. But uh, if uh, I think in order to get anything done, you have to be able to tell a story mm-hmm. and you have to tell it in a way that gets other people involved yeah. and uh, so they pitch in with it. And, and that's how those volunteers and, turn up. And that's, yeah. Yeah. No, that's okay. sales. <laughs> <laughs> so what have you read or listened to or watched recently that you'd recommend to others? It's on systems and failures. Okay. Uh, Dietrich Dorner uh, is the author. It's a book about complex systems and mm. uh, controlling complex systems. And it's something that humans are not really very well equipped to do to operate this world that we've created. Hmm. And so it's a very interesting, hmm. a, a very interesting well, that's book. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Okay, so you're sitting down across the table from 90-year-old Chris. What do you, what do you think yes. he'll say to you today? Interesting. I would probably be uh, sort of cursing myself for overthinking so much during my life <laughs> <laughs> because that that slows doing uh, right hmm. you can you can plan or you can do but you get paid for doing and I I love the exercise of planning and thinking about the future but you can easily overdo it and nothing gets done you don't yeah. make any money yeah right. so more peddling more <laughs> so peddling more peddling yeah more peddling, more peddling. Exactly. pedal more Chris pedal more okay <laughs> alright so as we wrap up how can listeners learn more about Habitat for Humanity getting in contact with you and your team starting at our uh, website is uh, good we post lots of news updates about sort of what our current activities are going on uh, Habitat International actually has a fairly good website with lots of information on sort of the global programs right. We've been talking about sort of the local affiliate and what we try to do to have a positive impact on our area. Uh, Habitat overall, though, is an international organization, and uh, they not only uh, build homes for people in all kinds of different 
third world countries. But they also have a lot of people who are thinking and working on how to improve land ownership rights. Uh, mm. uh, in particular, women are excluded from owning land in many places around the world. Mm-hmm. And that is uh, discriminatory because land is often one of the things that a family can use to present uh, a sort of a more stable uh, future for their children. Yeah. And uh, so they do lots of good things uh, around the world. Uh, based on the money that we generate here in the U.S. That's great. And so we'll have a a link to those websites uh, in the show notes so people can go check out and and see where they'll be able to make an impact around the world. That's great. I love this conversation. Thank you so much, Chris. Yes. I'm looking forward (laughs) to seeing the new house that you're going to be building and and hearing the story that you're you're going to be a part of the story for this family that you guys are going to be building in this house. No, it's cool. That's exciting. Awesome. Well, uh, check out the show notes at thecareerq.com. We'll... uh, We'll actually continue this conversation with Chris Anderson. This is not the last time you'll hear from him. All right. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Be sure to head on over to thecareerq.com where you can get more information, show notes, and related articles to today's topic. Also, if you like what you're hearing, head on over to iTunes, subscribe to the podcast, and make sure you leave us a rating and review. We'd love to hear your feedback. Thanks again. The Career Q podcast is produced by Lens Group Media and recorded at Jack Straw Cultural Center in the lovely Seattle, Washington. Hey, that was a great procedure, Chris. <laughs> wow, that worked perfectly. <laughs> <laughs>